good time to start. Okay. Hey, uh, just a quick welcome to everybody here. My name is Chris Fusco. Uh, I'm the executive editor of Lookout Local, Lookout Santa Cruz. Um, we really want to thank uh, our four 21 for 21 subjects for uh, being willing to dive a little deeper with us uh, tonight on this series that we've created to sort of explore recovery uh, in the upcoming year. Uh, when we talk about diving deeper, that's everything that we're all about here at uh, Lookout Santa Cruz in our first uh, few weeks of being born here. And uh, you know, a big part of what we're trying to do differently than a lot of media companies is community engagement. And this is just the start of many conversations that we hope to be having using uh, some of the best journalists in the county and the country, Wallace Bain, chief among them, uh, to sort of lead those efforts. I'd really like to thank our sponsors here, Santa Cruz County Community, or excuse me, the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce, Cruz IO Internet, Choose Santa Cruz and Event Santa Cruz. Um, one note about the Q&A. Um, we are gonna do the Q&A uh, sort of virtually with, uh, with folks being able to submit questions in the chat. And then our panelists will try to do their best to answer them uh, after, as and after Wallace is interviewing them. Uh, if you like what you see, of course, you can always click that become a member button on our website and uh, support us here, even as we're still free to the public uh, for our limited time. Uh, with that, Wallace, I'm gonna let you uh, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you to everyone who has uh, joined us tonight and um, welcome. It is December, it is, um, it's an it's a old feature writer's habit to spend December looking for retrospective reflections of the year just passed and, uh, and as someone who's definitely an old feature writer. Um, I'm, I'm prone to that more than most people, I think. This year, more than any, I think, demands of us to look back as a means to say, I survived this, but also as a way to think about the years ahead. Our 21 for 21 series at Lookout Santa Cruz is a collection of pieces that visit with community leaders, all of whom found themselves in the middle of uh, the drama of of 2020 on one or more of its um, many fronts. The COVID-19 pandemic being the big one, of course, but there was also the economic shutdown uh, that followed that uh, and the pain that that's caused uh, small businesses. There's the social justice reckoning that really unfolded um, this year in a remarkable way. And of course, the ruinous fires in Bonnie Doon, Davenport, and the San Lorenzo Valley that we're all still healing from. Here we are on the verge of another um, stay-at-home order, but with a vaccine on the horizon and um, a new administration in Washington and a great urge to learn the lessons of 2020, we have some reason to think things might be a little different in 2021, even though things like viruses and fires don't care about our human calendars that much. So we're going to visit with some of the community leaders that we have featured in our 2021, uh, uh, 21 in 21 series, and um, see if they can give us um, a little bit of uh, illumination, uh, some reflection on what happened in 2020. Um, so we are going to start with um, our first guest, who is uh, Isabella Bonner. Bella Bonner, she is an activist and organizer uh, who grew up locally um, in a biracial household. Last summer, um, moved by the killings of Breonna Taylor in Kentucky and George Floyd in Minneapolis, through her organization, Blended Bridges, she helped organize a march and rally on um, June the 3rd on Westcliff Drive. Um, and, and there was also another one after that in Capitola. Um, Bella, thanks so much for joining us and welcome. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. One of the things that I have been uh, asking our 21 for 21 um, uh, 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 subjects was to kind of go back and remember the drama of the year. And I wanna ask you about that June 3rd rally. Um, it was pretty amazing. It, um, 
it went from, um, was it, it ended at Lighthouse Field, right? And it started at the wharf, am I right? Correct, yeah, I started at the Dream Inn in the parking lot there. Tell us about how that came about and um, uh, what the, it was what, a week or so after the um, death of George Floyd, is that right? Yeah, right, right around there. Um, and you know how that really came came to be was you know there had been a series of other actions, um, and even down to in my workplace. And I found myself super disappointed by the folks that were centering themselves. I felt like we, as a community, were missing a key opportunity to really center and hear from unheard voices in our community. Um, and so I really wanted to create a space that would uplift and center, you know, Black and our people of color community members and what it really means to, to live here and, and what it, we go through. Um, so that was the goal was really to center and amplify those voices. And it turned out, you know, more, more beautifully than ever we ever could have imagined um, hearing from high schoolers up to you know, adults who have been here for many years, um, hearing how things haven't changed um, for a lot of our high schoolers now um, really, really was eye opening. Um, and I was, I was really grateful for the people that were brave enough to share their stories um, that day. And, and quickly, for the event. That, I mean, you had, um, you had some flyers passed around, maybe a little social media, and that was it. Yeah, really, it was Instagram and Facebook, and it it just took over, which was incredible. Tell me a little bit about uh, about the scene that day. Were you shocked when you saw the people coming out? Did you anticipate that? I I don't think you could ever anticipate that. Um, you know, I just remember turning around. I think the second parking lot, and just seeing there was still a flood coming from the dream in and it was it was it was a really cool feeling just it was the most sense of community I've really ever felt while living here obviously these weren't all your friends and relatives you had to reach out in, in into the community um in a very impressive way um so the the march ended up at lighthouse field where there was speakers and uh, tell me what the vibe was at uh, the at that um, at that point yeah the energy was was remarkable it was just buzzing um, you know definitely didn't imagine the crowds we didn't have microphones set up to uh, to amplify as big as as big that were there but um, you know, it was, it was definitely uplifted and you could tell people were there to listen. And that was, that was the goal. And, you know, it was really remarkable in that sense. Did you speak yourself? I did. I, I had gone back and forth. I was so nervous. Um, but yeah, I, I spoke and brought up just how we can't, everyone has this moment, it feels like, um, and now it's it's a matter of really keeping it alive and not letting it be, you know, five years from now, um, new news to people. We really want to end it. Um, and so that that's really what I, what my message was that day. I'm sure it was very tough because there was a lot of rage. There was a lot of grief. There was a lot of mourning. I mean, this was, this was not a, 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 a moment of celebration. Um, how did you kind of calibrate the emotions of the crowd? I mean, what was that like? Were, were, was there a sense of anger and mourning and grief uh, there as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, everyone was angry. And I think one of the things that was really important to me to honor the victims um, you know, that were murdered was was honoring them through a moment of silence and having thousands of people you know kneel or just take that moment together um, is really powerful and that's something that you know it gives me goosebumps thinking about it you know it really was just so remarkable and the the greatest sense of community um, and union and unity I would say um, but definitely a lot of pain and anger um, in trying to find the right right way to channel to channel 
feel that uh, um, was important. Yeah, I imagine so. I imagine so. Obviously, Black people and African Americans are, are a very distinct minority in Santa Cruz County. Um, you must have seen quite a few uh, out there that day, and there, I imagine, a sense of of what uh, you tell me, uh, solidarity of, of of connection. Oh, absolutely. Um, I would say, especially for for the first one, we had it in open mic forum, and so you know, really it was me looking out into, into the crowd and people kind of were coming towards the forefront. And so definitely feelings of solidarity um, and just, I see you and I feel your struggle. Um, you know, I know what it feels like to be here too. Um, definitely, you just through eye contact through that moment, but, but they know. Um, Bella Bonner uh, grew up locally and um... She is contributing an essay to a book that I'm editing uh, at the end of the year. And um, in that essay, you talk very movingly about kind of a moment where you kind of had your eyes opened a little bit. Um, and it had to do with the death of Trayvon Martin in uh, 2012. And of course, his trial was the next year in 2013. He was, he was a young man. I think he was your contemporary, right? Wasn't he? Uh, he was, he was, I think, 17 or so when he was killed. Mm -hmm. And um, he, um, his killer was acquitted um, through Florida's stand your ground law at the time. That moment, you were a teenager yourself. Tell me about that. Was that, um, that must have really kind of came out of left field and really kind of did a number on you. Yeah, um, you know, Trayvon and I were, were born in the same year um, and I was a junior in high school. And I just remember, you know, social media still to this day, you know, we're, we're seeing the power of the tool and also the downside, but, you know, came into the forefront through social media and, you know, was, was a flat out murder. It was an injustice and most of us saw it for what it was. And I remember having a conversation with my mom and just, you know, breaking down and, you know, being like, I'm just saying, you know, justice is going to handle this justice, the system will do the right thing. And she really paused. And I just remember that moment of like, you know, don't you want the system to do what it's supposed to do? Um, but she really didn't, didn't want to break my heart. She didn't want to tell me that, you know, these systems aren't meant for us um, at all. And that was, the first time I really saw that um, in the mainstream media, you know, so in your face, you see, you see it. And um, it was heartbreaking. It, it still is thinking about it. I just feel like he was a baby and he should still be here with us. Um, and so that really, it did change a lot of things, especially when, you know, the acquittal came through and, you know, you see the non-guilty verdict and it, it it just doesn't make sense. And to this day, it doesn't make sense um, what we continue to see. And so, you know, it's, it's, in my opinion, a disgrace how many lives it's taken for people to open their eyes. Um, and, you know, George, George Floyd, you know, these people aren't going to die in vain, and that's up to us. And so it's, I just think it needs to stop. And so I, it's a lot of pain, um, just seeing it continue to play out, you know, not guilty over and over again. There were, of course, a lot of these kinds of killings before Trayvon and since. And, um, um, but it seems that the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd this year represented some kind of tipping point uh, in the larger culture. Do you think that um, uh, it left an influence on the culture that perhaps the killings before it had not? Um, I think this year really was a different type of storm. You know, we were, it started with the Mod Arbery, you know, we're all at home, it's a pandemic, people are staying home and black people are still being murdered by the police, like how? Um, and so I think it kind of came with just this timing of people being at home, um, seeing it on your screen, social media, it just was really this cross between everything. I don't think, 
you know, there's anything more significant about these murders by the police than any other. I think it just really was the timing and the storm of 2020. Um, Right. collectively. Right. And um, we're seeing things happen since then that perhaps we didn't even ever anticipate we would see that. Um, um, let me ask you about 2021 and going forward. Um, you're still a young person. You have a lot of uh, activism and organization in front of you. Um, uh, what are your plans going forward? I mean, is it... it you don't want to be in a position where you're just reacting to these things, right? You want to be proactive in a lot of ways and, and kind of build something that's not just reacting to the next killing. Um, yeah, for me right now, it's really trying to focus on, on joy and the health, um, you know, really focusing on Black Surf Club has been, you know, a really good outlet. I know it's very separate, but, you know, mental health is really important in this last year has been a lot. And so this next year, I plan on continuing to build community, um, you know, working on various advisory boards, um, working closely with the advisors on the Black Health Matters team, um, is really important to focus on just longevity and really giving back to our communities in concrete, sustainable ways, I would say, is really where I, I plan to, you know, focus in on coming up. You mentioned the Black Surf Club earlier. I, I don't think a lot of people know what this is. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what that is. Yeah, so Black Surf Club is, you know, really aiming to create a safe community space for our BIPOC community members to learn how to surf, um, focusing on our black community, but open to all people of color, um, really again, focusing on community building, um, joy and just being in a, in a safe space together. Um, and in my opinion, it's a form of reparations. You know, we have, we're funded solely by the community. Um, you know, all of our instructors are purely volunteers and so, um, really giving back to our community in a physical way uh, when we don't have many options right now is really important. Um, do you feel optimistic? I mean, it's, this is a loaded question to ask someone who is young because those of us who aren't young anymore, I mean, we, <laughs> it's, there's a different calculus. Um, you may live very deep into this century. Uh, how do you feel about the future? Um, I feel nervous. I, I'm hopeful that there's going to come a point where we stop allowing history to repeat itself. But, you know, until we start making some concrete changes and doing things differently, I'm hope cautiously hopeful. Um, but, you know, I'm, I really want to see things change. I want to see a different, I want it, I don't want it, you know, to all keep repeating itself. I, I don't want names to continue to be hashtags. So um, I really want to see concrete change that's tangible and, you know, happens swiftly. <laughs> well, I think it was MLK who said the arc of history bends towards justice, but some people have to do that bending. And I think you're one of those people. So, uh, so congratulations. And um, thank you, Bella Bonner, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much to Bella. Um, our next uh, uh, guest is, is going to be um, Bonnie Lipscomb. Let's bring Bonnie forward. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Wallace. How are you? I'm good. Bonnie is the Director of um, Economic Development at the City of Santa Cruz, and uh, she has been the leader of a team there that really was um, a central figure in uh, the economy of Santa Cruz, weathering this storm. Um, Bonnie, I want to ask you first off, if you'll maybe set the scene for us about um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the, de the degree to which it kind of took everyone by surprise in the business community. Um, do you remember that time um, specifically and, and, and the kind of um, sense of surprise and the sense of suddenness that was that was happening early on? 
Yeah, I mean, starting back as early, I mean, we were all up, you know, following the news in February sort of about the pandemic, but it wasn't until March that suddenly it became our reality of what that impact was. And we all immediately were in, you know, you mentioned um, with Bella, sort of we were in reactive mode. We have spent, you know, the last, you know, almost 10 months now um, reacting and we've been going through various phases, but immediately it was about you know, connecting with everyone um, across the counties, sort of regionally, obviously with our, you know, the, uh, Dr. Newell and um, at the county, but also across with the business connections across the county from the chambers, you know, to the community foundation, to the business council and the other jurisdictions to just make sure we're sharing information immediately because we're, we're all trying to, to understand this new information that's coming down and what the impacts are. And we're all trying to interpret this information in real time and not confuse our business community. Everyone is sort of wanting to know what does this mean? Um, so we had a lot of early coordination and really that's continued, you know, throughout, you know, since, since March, it's really been critical to be able to be as responsive as possible to our business community during this time. But, you know, with, you know, as is obvious, it's been completely, you know, an upheaval. Um, everything as we know it for businesses has, has been pretty much turned on its head um, over the last, you know, 10 I'm trying months. to imagine what the phone calls were like that first day or two to your office. I mean, because small businesses, uh, they're not going to call Jimmy Panetta or something. They're going to call you. They're going to say, hey, what's going on here? And you had to have information. Um, what were people wanting out of you early on? You know, they were just wanting to, mostly it was interpreting what the governor's order was. Like, what does this mean? As you're reading it, they're like, wait, we have to close our business? Like, just that in itself was, I think, unfathomable when it first came out of really trying to understand, like, how do we work around this? Like, are we an essential, essential business? Are we not? What does that mean? What's the definition for essential? I mean, those were some of the very, very early conversations. And then really just making sure we're communicating with our council, we're communicating with the community and making sure that the information that we have in real time is accurate. That was just a constant check-in across the board, you know, with the county. Um, and really, I'd say it, it what this year has been about, I think, for us at the local government level is just how important our, our communication is and our partnerships and collaboration across the county. I mean, it's been the key for all of us. None of us are doing this, you know, completely on our own. We're all working together. I guess the only analogy we have is the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, and there probably isn't many people on the city staff that were there. That was 30 plus years ago now. Yeah. Um, but you were able to draw from those lessons a little bit. Yeah, you know, surprisingly, there are a few from uh, right after the earthquake that are around. And we fortunately had a couple in our department who have since retired, but were pivotal, you know, in the last 15 years of sharing those lessons with us. And uh, they were quick to call us to say, this is just like the earthquake. And this is what we did. So uh, you know, obviously the, what you do is different under a pandemic than what you did on a, on, you know, after an earthquake. And this was, you know, the whole, the whole region and the impacts are different, but that sense of community, I think is very, very similar. It was almost a sense of business as usual had to be kind of suspended, right? We have to kind of create new rules, new protocols. It was almost like, um, building the plane as you were flying it kind of, right? It was. It was. I mean, yeah, I mean, of... from trying to develop the, um, you know, what's the six, six foot distancing and us having the same signage that businesses could post them on their door so that they could communicate it's actually safe to shop here. You know, I think our uh, temporary outdoor expansion program, largely used by restaurants, but other businesses have as well, being able to adapt to that sort of ever-changing environment was really important for businesses. Uh, you know, it was just, it was, it, particularly the first few months, it was all about survival. Sure, that, um, that happened later in the summer when all the restaurants kind of came out. And um, I guess the, the, the permitting process had to be adapted and changed also um, and because time was of the essence. Uh, did you have to um, sort of put aside the playbook for permitting as well? 
We did, but, you know, because everyone, you know, everyone was on deck, we had, you know, just in real time conversations between, you know, our planning, building, fire department, you know, public works, parks and rec, we were all discussing together what it would take to turn around those permits. And so we completely changed how we did, how we did permitting. In some cases, we were able to issue permits within the same day um, for businesses to expand outside. At the same time, we were ordering K rails, you know, because people were expanding into parking spaces on the street. And so we're trying to make those safe, you know, for the public to come downtown. So it actually feels comfortable in that space, but really it was everyone recognizing that we have to, uh, react and come up with a different way of doing things because businesses need our help today, not a month down the road. You know, Bonnie, it's kind of strange to talk about this as if it's something that happened a long time ago. We're very much still in the middle of it. We, um, it, was, it was announced today, as a matter of fact, that the governor has, uh, in the Bay Area region, in which Santa Cruz is included, the stay-at-home order is going to go into effect, I believe it's midnight tomorrow. Um, That's right. I have that right. Um, so here we go again, kind of. I mean, it must feel yeah. like a groundhog day to you at the city, but at least you have... I guess the experience of March and April before you go into this, what's the thinking like right now with the businesses and the city in your ability to help them? Well, I mean, the timing is not ideal. So many businesses were really counting on this holiday season to make up for all the early incredible losses that their businesses face. So that's not good. Um, I think what is different this time around is because of the creativity in our community and those partnerships and, coll and collaborations like Ride Out the Wave and we now have shopsantacruzcounty.org and we have a whole shop local campaign and we've really seen the difference. I mean, just in our downtown dollars alone, it's like 10 times the number of downtown dollars sold this season so far than we had last year. So the community is really coming out and supporting and finding creative ways to shop online, support our businesses. You know, outdoor dining has been really successful. Obviously that's going to be impacted this time around, at least for the next three weeks. It's a three week minimum time that we're gonna be in the regional stay home order. And we'll continue to assess as long as our, our intensive care unit beds are lower than 15% but hopefully we'll be, you know, we'll find some capacity, you know, within the month and the restaurants will be able to open back up for outdoor dining. So I think this time around, it's still, the timing's not great with the holiday season, but I think the community is really coming out to support the businesses. And, and that's going to continue well into 2021, um, that community need to support local. Another thing that happened today, um, big news is the, first people in Santa Cruz County received the COVID vaccine. So there is, that's another difference, I think, is that we see something on the horizon that may be yeah. a game changer, really. And um, I don't want to get too out over my skis here, but I have seen a couple of people write about how there could be a boom coming in 2021 from all this kind of pent up economic energy, if we can get through to next summer and have this vaccine kind of make a difference. Um, how do you feel about the year coming, uh, 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 coming up and the business community's ability to bounce back? Um, are you optimistic about that? You know, I, I think, yes. <laughs> I, that's, it's definitely a layered, a layered answer. And, um, I, what I am encouraged by is just seeing that the support and seeing the creativity of our business owners, of their desire to work through this, seeing the um, generosity of some of our property owners in reducing or waiving rent and just that recognition that we all are working together. So when I look forward, one of the things you see now, there actually are new businesses in Santa Cruz opening during this time. In the downtown alone, we have nine new businesses and two more on the way. I just uh, answered questions today. Um, and our, our team in economic development is working with folks about a new brewery that's coming. So, I mean, it's just, there is still hope. There are still entrepreneurs out there that see Santa Cruz, see our broader community as a great place to do business. So I am optimistic for 2021. I do think there's a lot of hard work ahead of us. There's a lot we need to do. Um, I think we need to continue to provide support by changing the way we do business, the way we support businesses um, around our community. And I, and I think we're 
collaborating across. That's one of the big changes too, is not just with jurisdictional boundaries. We are collaborating across the county to work together to try to provide business support. And that's a change that has been so positive. Uh, we've always worked together before, but not this closely. And I think that's making all the difference and we'll continue to do that in the year ahead. What's fascinating about that is that the new world that emerges might look very different than the old world. And you and I have talked about this in the past about how the work world, um, because mm -hmm. of Zoom and remote work and all that might, might be a different animal altogether and that might impact office space downtown. I mean, yeah. the downtown might look differently in a few years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it was on its way to looking differently. I mean, the way, you know, retail changes and it, retail has been changing and it's, it's, I think it is being impacted quite a bit. We see in the last year um, with the impact of online shopping, a lot more uh, experiential retail, um, people coming to have that, you know, really firsthand brick and mortar experience where you go into the store and you have more personalized shopping and you have other experiences when you're in that retail that you just can't get online. So that was already happening, but I think this really, the pandemic really escalated the need for that change of creating something different when you go shopping. And I think as far as office, um, you know, Santa Cruz, I will say Santa Cruz is always going to be a really desirable place to live and therefore also work. And I think the pandemic has enabled a lot of people that work over the hill to look at Santa Cruz in a new way. So I do think there'll continue to be a desire and a need for some level of office space. It may be differently configured and maybe not as much space per, per business or company that we saw before, but I still think there's going to be a need. We're such social creatures, but we are changing. And I think one of the things we need to do at the city for businesses and for office space and for residential, which is dramatically changing in the downtown, we're going to have a lot more residential units in the next few years, but we need to look at how we zone our spaces, particularly in the downtown and some of our primary office and shopping and residential where you have these mix of uses. So we have more flexibility in how things are zoned, both for height and depth. So those are some of the changes that I see are going to be a necessity in the next year and, and, and going forward. Well, strap in, it's going to be a rough ride, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Bonnie Lipscomb, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Wallace. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Bonnie Lipscomb. That was great. That was, that was a terrific conversation. Next up, we're going to bring in Ruby Vasquez. Ruby, are you there? Hi, Wallace. Hi, yeah, I'm Ruby. sorry. <laughs> Ruby Vasquez is um, Watsonville born and raised. She's an educator, organizer, folklorico dancer also. Let's not forget that. And uh, she works for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District in the realm of parent education. But in 2020, Ruby spearheaded an ambitious effort to make sure that the campesinos, the field workers of Pajaro Valley, weren't forgotten when people began talking about this thing called essential workers. And um, Ruby, you began this, this uh, thing that has, been, that has been called the Campesino Appreciation Caravan. Um, it started as really a gesture of appreciation for what the campesinos were doing to contribute to the economy. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So, um, um, so we, a, a group of us gathered on a Zoom meeting just to support each other um, on a Friday night. And we found ourselves starting to talk about what was happening out there um, with the families that we serve, many of the my friends and families who family who were on that call are, um, you know, they work here in the community. They're educators. They were, you know, some counselors. We have a principal on our team, um, and we are very much aware of what the families were going through. And we um, no, we just started noticing on mainstream TV, mainstream media that the uh, title of essential worker was not being used when um, speaking of campesinos, of field workers. And yet we know um, because we, so many of us come from that background, we know how um, important that work is. I mean, my goodness, you know, they do put the food that we eat every day on our plate and the smoothies <laughs> that we drink, That's the right. salads that we eat, you know? Um, and yet once again, they just weren't, weren't being forgotten about. And so we, we did come together um, originally to go out and just say thank you, gracias. And we took our signs of appreciation and we had amplified 
messages and we would drive by the workplaces and and uh, just you know say thank you and uh, they were the reaction was 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 interesting because they were like what you know they they, they were like <laughs> you're they, they were used to being thanked up, I guess <laughs> yeah they ended up thanking us you know for going out there and um, we were just like very you know thought wow you know how humble these people are um, and so. Quickly, when the numbers started going up, we realized that um, that we needed to get information out. So then, our our drive bys, um, as we would drive by the the work sites, we also started taking you know packets of information. And so we get info. We were getting information just so that we can make sure we were pr uh, providing the correct information. We were getting information from Watsonville City. We were getting information from the um, Santa Cruz uh, Agricultural Commissioner's Office. We um, were getting um, information from Salud para la Gente. So we wanted to make sure we were giving out the uh, correct information about COVID safety. And, um, and then our packets started getting thicker and thicker with information about local community resources. Um, when Once school started, we started getting putting information about school. So our packet is quite hefty. And when we take it out to the campesinos, we do encourage them to just take some time when they get home after they've, you know, uh, gotten home and made dinner and such, to just take some time and read it because resources are here in our community. We're very lucky here in Watsonville to have the resources available. Let me ask you what happened when NBC came calling and um, did a feature on the caravan. Outsiders began to notice what you were doing at that point and they wanted to do something similar, right? Correct. So, um, or they wanted to help you, I guess. Well, they, it was both. It was both. Um, the, the NBC um, article was great. It, it did, um, it just went viral and we started getting lots of, um, we do have a Facebook page and, and that's what, that's where we started getting more comments on, you know, we want to join, we want to go and support. And at the time and until to this day, we really wanted to maintain the, um, the protocols. And so we, we, we didn't want people flocking into Watsonville to support uh, the campesinos here. The, there's campesinos all over California, you know, all over the country. And so, you know, we wanted to encourage folks to start their own um, caravans or their own uh, appreciation, uh, actions of appreciation. And so we put together like a, a little to-do sheet, like what to do before a caravan, what to do during a caravan and what to do after a caravan. And folks started, you know, um, using that, that, that document. And we actually were able to, you know, get on some Zoom meetings with folks um, who wanted to start one and uh, help them and just support them and answer their questions. And so there have been caravans in Salinas there's an ongoing caravan, um, Hijas del Campo um, in Brentwood. Um, there, there were a couple um, in, I believe, Hollister locally. So we were really happy that we were able to help them. But with that report, we got a slew of people wanting to contribute in many ways, not just monetarily, but you know, donating items and. So um, we did set up a, a, a GoFundMe page and we did get a fiscal sponsor through um, the Action Council of Monterey. And we were able to generate enough money um, that we've been able, that currently right now over the winter uh, season, since we knew the winter was gonna be a hard winter for many campesinos, um, we've been able to be, we've been able to give um, some monetary support to families. Uh, just on Saturday, we were able to give 35 families um, gift certificates of $500. And um, we were able to, um, with the CARES Act money that we were able, that we received, we were also able to do a, a wonderful holiday um, safety options for 100 campesinos where we were gifting them, you know, passes to the, the Santa Cruz Fairgrounds light celebration. We did a paint night. Um, we were just looking for options of what they could be doing with their family in a safe way during these holidays. And at the same time, continuing to put out the message about safety because the numbers here in Watson will continue to go up. And, um, you know, we need to be looking at things about, you know, 
uh, housing situations for campesinos, um, wages, you know, medical, um, their safety. We, we, there needs to be some work done in that area so that, um, so that campesinos don't have to be, you know, relying on like voluntary, volunteer support. Well, it's amazing how the caravan has uh, changed and adapted over the uh, over these months. It started out as an appreciation, right? And then it turned into an informational thing. Then you're giving them gifts and, and you know, uh, 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 things for the children. I mean, that suggests that this may, may become a movement, something that's, um, you know, very strong connection that wasn't there before between the people who pick our food and the rest of the community. Maybe that connection wasn't as strong as it, as it uh, needed to be. And you've built something that, that makes that connection stronger. Yeah, and I think it's you know, happened before, especially you know, with the work of the UFW. There's, there's, they've always been um, you know, promoting the rights and the needs of campesinos. Um, but I think what happens as a, as a society is we, we begin to forget you know, we forget, you know, we start, we, we, we all start to thrive and we all start to move on and go on. And we forget about the, the segments of our, of our communities that are, um, are doing essential work, but just aren't being able to, you know, reap the benefits. I mean, like, if you think about organic produce, I mean, many of the campesinos can't even purchase that. Um, for their for their families, you know. So, um, will this continue as far? I mean, uh, will this continue? Um, we, we I know our team has been have has said that we're um, we're committed to to continue this until there isn't a, a need due to COVID. What does that mean? I don't know, but um, I mean we are a very committed group of people and. Um, yeah, who knows, we may end up, we, I bet we will end up taking this a little further than what we think. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, now, you have a personal stake in this too, because you have a background in this. So you grew up in Watsonville. Your mom and dad um, still sell vegetables, right? Still have a farm, right? right? Where they're yes. Yes. And you have done this work in the past. So this is, this is personal to you as well. Very personal, not only to me, but many of our team members, because we all, most of our team come from uh, campesino families. And many of us it worked in the local fields here growing up, um, either as our weekend job or our summer job. And, um, and so, yes, we know that this job is, essential we know it's noble my parents um my my grandmother as a matter of fact w was the first one uh three generations now um ago to start a strawberry farm in moss landing and then my parents took it over so currently Vasquez farms and you can find them at any of our local farmers markets they're still doing it my parents are still running this business and um it takes a toll. I, going out there every morning, I mean, my goodness, at five in the morning to pick crops, to pick strawberries, raspberries, lettuce, everything that we are so fortunate to have in, in this area, uh, to be out there from you know five in the morning till sometimes 6 30, 7 at night when you know during spring. It's a it's a hard job, Wallace. When we're when we go out there and we're taking the taking a lunch. You know, it, we're, we're seeing, you know, that their cloth, the clothing is wet, the shoes are wet. I mean, um, it, it, I've, seen, it, I've seen how it's taken a toil on my dad, for instance. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard job and, and, it's, and it is very personal to many of us in, in this group. We um, see some of our students out there. Um, we've had students you know, high school students um, who, um, who, you know, when we're out there, we'll see, we see the parents of the families uh, of the school children that we serve. Um, it's so much about it is personal. And um, 
we are just hoping that the youth that, is, that are in our group, um, many of us have our, our high school children and, and they've been very involved in, in this effort. And that is very hopeful to see that they're taking this on and that their eyes are being open, just like Bella said, um, you know, as young, as, young, as young folks, sometimes it takes that, you know, active participation to have your eyes open. And we're hoping that that, we know, we know that that's happening with the young folks on our team. Well, I think with the work you're doing there, what you're helping is that the people in the fields picking the food that we all eat aren't invisible anymore. And uh, I think that's, that's something we owe them. So um, I congratulate you on your work and uh, a remarkable year for you, Ruby. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. That was Ruby Vasquez. And now um, we are turning to our last uh, 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 guest of the evening. It is Ryan Coonerty. Ryan, are you, uh, are you there? I am here. You're um, here. Thank, All right. Thank you, he Wallace. Is, uh, he is the uh, third district county supervisor, longtime city councilman, ex-mayor of Santa Cruz. Um, you know, Ryan, I, I could talk to you about any part of this year. I could talk to you about the social justice piece of it. I could talk to you about COVID, the economic part of it. But I want to talk to you about the fires uh, because you were a central player in us in Santa Cruz dealing with what might have been one of the most traumatic episodes in the history of this city, certainly. Um, you've been in local government for many years. You grew up in Santa Cruz. You were as a teenager, you were witness to the drama that your parents, Neil and Candy, as the owners of Bookshop Santa Cruz, went through with the book with, with the uh, with with the earthquake. And just give me a sense of where you think these fires in August rank in what you've had to deal with as a leader in in uh, Santa Cruz. Sure. Well, first, let me just say thank you for including me with an extraordinary group of leaders working at all across across our county and the way that everyone talked about how collaboration and resilience um, will be essential going forward um, and energy and some optimism. Um, I, I'm just I'm inspired and I'm grateful to be even uh, part of this conversation. Uh, yeah, this was um, this was the biggest disaster that's happened in Santa Cruz. Um, luckily, it wasn't the biggest loss of life. Um, but, uh, you know, at one point to have 70,000 people uh, evacuated um, in the midst of a pandemic, um, to have more than 900 people lose their homes, um, and uh, to just then so many of us, even if we didn't lose our homes, uh, we're either evacuated or we're living in smoke and fear. Um, it was a it was a scary time. Um, was, and I was just realizing it's four months ago today uh, that the fire, uh, the winds began in earnest, and the Waddell and Warren Ella fires combined to create this massive fire um, on the north coast and into and into San Lorenzo Valley. I want to set the stage a little bit. Um... You dealt with a personal tragedy this summer with the death of one of your staffers and a longtime friend, Allison. Um, sorry, Endhart, is that right? Eckhart? Uh, Endert, yeah. Endert, yeah. And um, she was taken in a hit and uh, was it a hit and run accident? I think she was a pedestrian, and that happened in June, if I have that right. Um, Correct. So you had heavy hearts already when this occurred some weeks later. Um, set the scene for me a little bit. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, like everyone, this has been a, a hard, miserable year. Uh, we had the uh, COVID hit in March and trying to respond to that. Um, my sister and my wife own small businesses. Um, and so trying to deal with that, I have two elementary school kids um, trying to deal with that and uh, the economic crisis that followed. And then, um, and then, and obviously then being moved by the racial justice issues um, 
uh, and the, the real the murders that were happening in our country and trying to respond to that. And then, um, yeah, each supervisor has two staff members. Uh, so it's a small office to respond to uh, all the policy and constituent concerns. And Allison had been my friend uh, since she was in college at UCSC and uh, mother to two young girls and uh, was struck crossing the street on her way back to a, a Zoom meeting that we were about to have uh, with a different community group and died. And so we were sort of, uh, Rachel Dan is my other aide and I, who's, Rachel, Allison was her best friend um, and coworker for more than uh, 12 years, had planned to sort of like, let's just, the two of us hunker down, let's focus on COVID, let's help the community and let's try to keep uh, keep things quiet. And then obviously in August, you had these two small, we saw the lightning strikes and everyone was, as a native Santa Cruzans, I thought this is, this is strange and kind of cool. Uh, I went down to the cliffs in the middle of the night like everybody else to check it out. Um, and then the fire struck and the wind struck and it became apparent that this was a massive, massive um, challenge and was gonna dominate uh, not only this year, but probably the next two years of my, my term on the Board of Supervisors as we try to help people re recover and rebuild and then build back better um, for the new, new reality we're in. Let's underline that um, Bonnie Dune is in your district, right? Yes, it is. And uh, a lot of the area near Davenport. Um, the Last Chance and the Swanton community, which were absolutely devastated. And then, yeah, uh, Bonnie Dune and uh, most of my district, then, then my district runs into the city of Santa Cruz. Right, right. So <laughs> this is a silly question, I know, but you must not have gotten much sleep this, that, that first week or so, I mean, what was that like? Were you up all night at the kitchen table? Kind of just- Yeah, kind of yeah that first- what was happening? That first Monday night, it was sort of, I was getting updates. And, oh, there's a fire and, you know, we're gonna let the Waddell fire burn out and there's a little fire in Warnella and we're monitoring it. We're gonna, you know, make sure we protect uh, homes. And um, then the winds kicked up and um, yeah, I spent the entire night sitting at my kitchen table trying to respond to people on Facebook, trying to get them information about when to evacuate. I was happy, um, as Bella mentioned, you know, social media is uh, in many ways making our lives worse. Um, but in this, there were specific groups for each one of these communities. And so we were able to get evacuation orders out a half hour before they otherwise would have gone out through these groups and people were going out and checking on their neighbors. But then once you told people to go, um, they needed somewhere to go. They needed somewhere to bring their animals. They needed somewhere um, to uh, to get you know food and water. Um, they needed they needed to get information, and so just spent all night and then almost essentially uh, 16, 17 hours a day online, just trying to respond to everyone's concerns and get people the information they need um, and connect them. And I will give big credit to to county staff who stood up shelters for all these people in the midst of a pandemic and animals um, and got and the small businesses that even though they were hurting donated food uh, and other essentials and uh, the community came together to help people um, as they are, still are. Uh, the community of Watsonville stepped forward and said, what do you need? And um, you know, came up with a fairgrounds. We had, a, we had hundreds and hundreds of animals there uh, and uh, it was really a countywide effort. That's got to be fulfilling when you find a connection and you can make somebody, you know, you, you can find a safe harbor for their animals or, or a place that they can go. What you were doing essentially was a logistics exercise um, against a, a ticking clock, essentially. Um, <laughs> I mean, it must have been felt, it must have uh, felt like you were moving mountains. Yeah, or um, uh, I guess trying to communicate across mountains because uh, you had, you know, you had a whole different situation going on in San Lorenzo Valley. We had uh, initially like a thousand then 2000 and 3000 firefighters here. We're trying to call in federal resources. We're trying to call in state resources. There were more than 400 fires around the state. So 
Um, at some point, it became a matter of who could scream the loudest to get uh, to get more firefighters. Um, trying to coordinate with UCSC, the residents of the city of Santa Cruz who were starting to wonder, you know, the fire was getting closer and closer. Um, and again, all in the context of a pandemic where we couldn't normally, the normal way we'd work is we just open up the, the Civic or the Kaiser uh, Permanente Center and just let people stream in. But you can't do that in a pandemic, right? You have to have people six feet apart and distanced. Um, and so uh, it was a whole different scale of operation. Imagine, I imagine if you and I were, uh, were talking in the summer of 2019 and I said, Ryan, this is what you're going to face in 2020. You're going to go, no, get out of here. Forget that. That's well, I mean, I, I think too much. I was listening, yeah, I was listening to Bonnie talk and I was like, you know, if you came and told me that like we had to close five businesses for a month uh, and you told me in 2019, I would have been like, nope, sorry, that's impossible. Right. Uh, and if you told me we had to evacuate 10,000 people, I would have told you that was impossible. Um, so there is, I mean, there are lessons to be learned and inspiration to be had at our ability to meet the moment and our ability to care about each other, um, as at our ability to even in the most difficult times to come together and sacrifice a little bit so that um, so that we can make sure we're all safe. Um, and you know, Bella and Bonnie and Ruby's work um, is are perfect examples of uh, of those kinds of efforts and the difference that can make. You mentioned it earlier, um, but I need to underscore it here. At the same time, these catastrophic fires were happening. There were similar fires all over the state of California. So we couldn't stand up and go, well, you know, we're special, uh, unlike the earthquake in which the epicenter was here and the entire country's uh, attention was on Santa Cruz. You didn't even have that advantage. Yeah, that's been the real challenge is, you know, after the earthquake, it was a localized disaster. So FEMA and the Red Cross and all those resources are sort of pumped in directly. Um, and uh, in this context, COVID is obviously a global uh, problem and the resources are spread globally. Um, we also have a failed federal government uh, and an administration, which doesn't help uh, with leadership. But then um, even with the state fires, yeah, there was full, more than 400 fires and I would call the California Director of Emergency Operations and scream that we need we need more firefighters and he'd say yeah what are you again <laughs> yeah exactly he's like you know everyone needs more firefighters uh you know um and uh i got i got 400 fires and i can only i only have so many firefighters but i will say there's been a couple i mean there were a couple standout uh, anna eshu uh leveraged uh some national guard uh firefighters uh to come in the because we have the Ch Chitoni Coast Areas National Monument on the North Coast, uh, we brought in the Bureau of Land Management firefighters, a hotshot crew uh, from the Central Valley uh, who were there. And they're actually there, it's a crew of veterans uh, from uh, the military who come back and get involved in this hotshot crew as both job training and therapy and everything else. Um, and they basically saved this, the town of Davenport. Um, uh, by going out in the poison oak and cutting lines and uh, fighting fires by hand. And so uh, there's been extraordinary people um, who, uh, you know, who, who, who made a big difference. The firefighter uh, commander that I first toured uh, Bonnie Dune with, um, he, uh, he lost his house in the fire up near Roseville while he was down here fighting this fire. Um, so it was, um, it was a very, very difficult time. And while it's hard to sit at your kitchen table for 16 hours and do this kind of work, you still have to keep in mind the people who are out there in the field doing something 10 times more difficult. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and the, the disaster service workers who are staffing uh, homeless shelters and handing out food and, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the restaurants that donated made food and brought it into the shelters. Um, it was, it was extraordinary that people, people, people rolled up their sleeves and went to work. And again, in the midst of a pandemic where it's not, um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to stay at home. Uh, but people, people made the choice to get out and help the community. 
Well, it would be nice if, if, if we could say, well, that'll never happen again, but we can't say that, of course. Um, when you think about 2021 and beyond, is there anything that we can take out of what happened in 2020 and hold it up as good news? Maybe we figured some things out we didn't know before. Maybe we developed a process or, or two that, 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 will, that will help next time. Anything along those lines? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot. I mean, um, you know, a tangible thing is we have this uh, crew here, uh, contractors who are doing the rebuild permits for people who lost their homes. They think they can uh, approve a permit in two weeks. Um, so I've told county staff if they can do it in two weeks, and we usually take two years. Let's let's see what we can learn and try to do it in two months. Um, and um, but I mean, it's really about what everyone on the panel has talked about tonight, which is. Um, we, we needed to adapt, uh, we needed to uh, help each other. There, there's a recognition that we, we can't just sort of make sure we're okay and not worry about our farm workers, not worry about the, the BIPOC community, not worry about our small businesses. We're all intertwined and we can't be successful unless we're all successful. Um, and so, and then also frankly, having the optimism, it takes optimism for people to show up to march or to bring food or to support a small business. And so to the extent that um, they can be out, uh, the people still believed enough and loved enough, loved each other enough and love this community enough to, to help each other is what we build on uh, in 2021 as we, as we rebuild, but more importantly, sort of build in resilience because this is not, we got more crises to come uh, and we need to uh, we need to build our systems and our communities in ways that they can they can absorb the shocks um, and maybe even find ways um, to benefit from those disruptions uh, for the betterment of, of everyone. Ryan Coonerty, third district supervisor, here's wishing you a very boring year in 2021. How's that sound? <laughs> exactly. I can't. I'm, I'm, I would, nothing would make me happier than a nice boring year. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Wallace. And that means we come to the end of our program. I want to thank everyone who um, tuned in. Uh, just great, great uh, uh, gratitude uh, to Ryan Coonerty, to Ruby Vasquez, uh, to uh, Bella Bonner, and to Bonnie Lipscomb, who all have amazing stories to tell. It's um, amazing that I can call them up and hear their stories. Um, it's, it, uh, it gives us all, I think, an impetus to look forward to the new year and uh, convince ourselves that if we survive this, we can, we can survive anything. I also wanna thank Matthew Swinnerton and Jed Williams of uh, Lookout Santa Cruz um, for doing the hard work to put this meeting together. I, I uh, uh, thank you guys and I wish all of you a good night and a happy new year. Thank you so much. Thanks thank you everyone. everyone. Thanks Wallace. Thank you, Wallace. thank you everyone. One, One final uh, programming note. We, uh, we did record this, so it will be uh, broadcast on our website in perpetuity. Uh, at lookoutsantacruz.com. And if you attended tonight, you'll also be getting a, a little follow-up email from us as soon as we can get the technology to get it out uh, that encourages you to read the profiles of Bella, Ruby, and Bonnie and the one to come uh, for uh, Supervisor Coonerty at, at, our, uh, at our 21 for 21 series homepage. So again, thanks to everybody and, and uh, have a good evening. All right.